This morning we are in the fifth of a six-part series that uh, we're calling Male and Female, He Created Them. Uh, probably won't take a lightning quick mind to figure out why or what we're, what we're dealing with here. Uh, over the last four weeks, I've been very encouraged by the number of people who have come to me and uh, said encouraging things about my bravery and my courage in speaking on these issues and how hard it is, uh, no doubt, to talk about these things because they're so controversial and uh, not well received in a lot of Christian circles. And I appreciate that very, very much, but I must sort of throw it back to you and say, this is, this is the easy place to talk about these things. I mean, I'm among friends here, and, and I know you are part of this church because you're already convinced of these things for the most part, and I'm still working on a few of you. But it's out there in the world where this is hard, and it's not me, it's we. In this case, Ben, it is we. We have to have courage. You have to have courage. And really what I'm trying to do in this series is give all of us the courage to stand on the word of God in a culture that is increasingly hostile to the truth. And we have to leave this discussion ready to be faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ no matter what anybody else says. So I appreciate the encouragement, and I am encouraged, but let me encourage you. We're in a battle. You are in a battle. And we have to speak up, and it's not going to be received well all the time. We're going through this series because we need to be sure of what to do when our culture's demands conflict with God's demands. We have to know what to do. We have to know how to think. Right now, the American culture is demanding that we accept and endorse gayism and transgenderism. That's what they're demanding. They're saying we have to be excited for them and be encouraging about their newfound freedom. But as Jesus followers, of course, we cannot do that. We can't accept them, we can't endorse them because Jesus doesn't endorse them. We must not waver. We don't live by what the government tells us. As Christians, we don't live by the government. As Christians, we don't live by science. And as Christians, we don't live by what our gay and transgender family and friends tell us. As Christians, we live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. We stand there regardless of the cost. My family was back in St. Louis a couple of weeks ago for uh, vacation, and in one of the uh, church services, I guess the only church service we went to uh, over the Sunday we were there, the passage the, the pastor preached from was Ezekiel chapter 2, and I thought it was fitting, so I'm just going to steal his sermon today. No, he didn't actually go here, but he did read this passage, and I, I thought it was uh, very appropriate for the mindset of, of where we need to be as Christians. This is uh, Ezekiel's call to the prophet, uh, prophetic uh, uh, office, and here's what God said to him. He said, Son of man, stand on your feet that I may speak with you. As he spoke to me, Ezekiel says, the spirit entered me and set me on my feet, and I heard him speaking to you. Then he said to me, <coughs> son of man, I'm sending you to the sons of Israel to a rebellious people who have rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me to this very day. I'm sending you to them who are stubborn and obstinate children, and you shall say to them, thus says the Lord God. As for them, whether they listen or not, for they are a rebellious house, they will know that a prophet has been among them. Can you imagine this being your call to ministry? God shows up and says, get on your feet. I'm going to send you to people that don't like me at all, and they're not going to like you at all, and they're rebellious, they're stiff-necked. They won't go where I tell them to go, and they may or may not listen to you. 
But Ezekiel, you're going to stand and tell them, this is what the Lord says. And if nothing else, they will know that a prophet of the Lord was in their midst. Now, there are, there's a, a breakdown in parallel. The United States of America is not Israel. We are not in covenant with God like Israel was. God has not laid out this covenant of blessings and cursings and said, if we'll obey him, he'll bless us, and if we disobey, he'll curse us. There's a difference in the relationship, but there still is a sense that we as the church are the prophets of God, and we are to go into the world and say, thus says the Lord. And we want to make sure we leave the impression that a prophet of God has been in their midst. Israel knew better. America doesn't know better in the same way. We have to call them to the truth. We must have the same spirit that the apostles had in Acts chapter 5. You remember that story, no doubt? The, Jews, the, uh, the disciples were preaching to the Jews in Jerusalem. The Sanhedrin didn't like it at all. And they said, stop it. Stop preaching the gospel. Stop talking about Jesus. And what did the disciples do? They kept right on talking about Jesus. And finally, the Sanhedrin brought them in and said, we told you, we warned you, stop this. And Peter looks at them and says, we have to obey God, not man. We're not going to stop because this is God's work. We are going to continue to preach the good news of Jesus Christ. We're going to continue to preach this message to these people. Do to us whatever you want to. We will not waver because it matters. Now, we have to be clear in our minds. The apostles were not merely standing on truth. They weren't simply saying, we will not budge. They cared about the sinfulness of the Jewish people and their eternal state. They preached it not only because they were loyal to Jesus, but because they cared about the Jews. They wanted the Jews to be reconciled to God, to get right with God. And if they had listened to the Sanhedrin council and kept their mouths shut, then thousands upon thousands of Jews would not have heard the gospel and they cared about them and so they preached and they preached and they preached no matter what the government did to them. That's the posture we as Christians have to have. We have to love the people of Colorado Springs enough to proclaim the truth, to preach the truth no matter what the government or society or anybody else does to us. It's right, it's pleasing to the Lord, and people need it. But it will come at a cost. It will come at a cost. Jesus warned us. He, 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 he predicted this for us. He told us, it's not going to be pleasant if you become my disciple. Here's what he said in Luke chapter 14. Large crowds were going along with him, and he turned and said to them, if anyone comes to me, it's hard to sometimes believe these words are in the Bible, isn't it? If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Don't miss what Jesus is saying here. He doesn't say it's really hard to be my disciple if you don't do these things. He doesn't say you'll be a poor disciple. He says you cannot be my disciple. Well, wait a minute. What about all those passages that say husbands love your wives and love your children? Well, I don't think he actually means hate them, but in comparison to our loyalty to Christ, That's what he's getting at. And, and to flip it around another way, if there is anything that we care about more than Jesus, anyone we care about more than Jesus, we can't be his disciple. That's what he said. I'm not making this up. Those are Jesus' words. Next verse. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me, Carry the own cross. You, it, it's not like we're going to atone for anybody's sins, but we take the shame of the cross. That means people looking at us are ashamed of us. They mock us. They insult us. They don't like us. That's the shame he took. He says, if you're not willing to take 
that same kind of shame that I take and, and follow me even to the point of death, you can't be my disciple. These are hard words. Next verse. For which one of you, Jesus says, when he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? Think about it before you become a Christian. Make sure you know what you're getting into. It's going to cost you everything. Otherwise, when he's laid a foundation and he's not able to finish, all who observe it begin to ridicule him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, when he sets out to meet another king in battle, will not first sit down and consider whether he is strong enough with 10,000 men to encounter the one coming against him with 20,000? Or else, while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So then none of you can be my disciple who does not give up all his possessions. I would say in our context, I think Jesus would say, you can't be my disciple if you're not willing to set aside your reputation your sexual preferences, or anything else that is more valuable to you than me. You've got to put it all aside. When we come to Christ, we give him everything. He gave his everything, and he says, here's what I want in return. Give me everything. Then he makes this statement. Therefore, salt is good, but if even salt has become tasteless, with what will it be seasoned? There's our statement about our interaction with the culture. We're the salt of the earth. We have the truth of Christ. We have the truth of what God expects for husbands and wives, men and women, male and female, and all that. And if we don't tell the truth, who will? Who will? Nobody will. If we lose our saltiness, there's no salt because we are the salt of the earth. If we compromise, if we become cowardly, if we become refrained and restrained in the truth of God's word, no one is going to know the truth of God's word because we're the ones that have it. We are the ones who know how God designed humans. We are the ones who know why he made males and females. We are the ones who know what sexual relationships are supposed to be that please God. We know the truth, and we are worthless to the world if we don't tell them straight up how it is. We're worthless to the world. We have nothing to offer them if we aren't willing to stand for the truth. So that's why we're doing this whole series. That's why I'm doing this whole series. You know this. I know you know this. But we all need courage. We all need the reminder that it's real and it's true and the opposition is coming. It's already here, but it's going to get worse. And We must stand firm because we love the world. We love Jesus enough to proclaim the truth and we love the world enough to be salt even if they don't like us. Because some of them will. Some of them will come, and they will join us, and they will get right with God, and it will be worth it. So that's why we're talking through these things. So these first four messages, the, the first four messages were, uh, were actually pretty easy compared to this one. Um, because uh, we've talked about gayism, we've talked about transgenderism. I'm not really afraid of any of those, but today we're going to talk about feminism. I'm a little afraid of that one. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> it's another ism. In fact, this is the ism that set the stage for the other two. Feminism set the stage for where we are now with gayism and transgenderism. I'm going to try to show you that, and then we'll look at what the Bible says about Male headship. Feminism tries to eradicate the distinctions between men and women. That's what they've been trying to do for decades now. And feminism has to do this if it's going to succeed. Everything hinges on eradicating the difference, the distinctions between men and women. The only reason a woman might be treated differently from a man is if she's different from a man. Right? So they have to eliminate the distinctions. 
And this has to be extended to every aspect of life. If a man can have a full-time career, so can a woman. If a man can be a CEO, so can a woman. If a man can be a four-star general, so can a woman. If a man can be a president, so can a woman. I'm not suggesting whether this is right or wrong. I'm simply saying this is the logical progression of feminism. There cannot be distinctions. Anything a man can do, a woman can do. Better, right? That's the goal. Think about the term reproductive rights. Why did this become the mantra decades ago for feminism, for women's liberation? Why is it still the mantra very much so in the news today? Reproductive rights. Think about it. Why is this the rallying cry for women who want to be able to kill their babies? Why do they call it reproductive rights? Why do abortionists, what, what rights are abortionists fighting for? Well, what is it that a man can do reproductively that a woman can't? He doesn't have to live the consequences of his relationship with the woman. A man has the freedom, he's always had the freedom, so to speak, to get a woman pregnant and then walk away. Now, he may have to pay a father's fee. He might have to pay child support, but he just, he pays his check, he walks away, doesn't have to live with the consequences of what he's done. Women didn't used to have that freedom, that right. A woman was the one bearing the child. Now she is strapped with this, this responsibility. She has to raise the child. He gets to have his fun and be done, and she is stuck with a kid. At least that was the case until the 1970s. See, she was distinct from man in this sense. But in the 1970s, there was a radical change. 1973, Roe v. Wade. Now she has the same right as he does. Feminism has made it so the girl has the same reproductive freedom as the guy. She can pay a fee, and actually now it's paid by all of our taxes. She can pay this and be rid of the burden of the child. There's no longer a distinction between the man and the woman. Why do you think they picked the name Planned Parenthood? So that the women can plan when they're going to be parents. The man's always been free to do that. He just leaves. And in certain parts of the country, in certain times, yeah, maybe there's a little public shame, but at the end of the day, he could just go and live his life. He's free to not be a parent. But the woman was always stuck. But now, she can plan as well when she's going to be a parent because she can end her pregnancy. Now, there's no longer a distinction between men and women when it comes to an unwanted pregnancy. Men and we, women have equal reproductive rights. So for feminism, distinguishing between a man and a woman is the highest human sin. All violations are considered discrimination. They're oppressive. They're hateful. And any suggestion that males and females are distinct brings quickly the labels of sexist or misogynist. You hear it in the news every day. If you've been listening this week, you hear it all the time. You guys, they're out there with their picket signs, right? You guys are taking away our reproductive rights. You're oppressing women. You hate women. This, all this business with this uh, Center for Medical Progress, the videos they're pumping out, and Planned Parenthood's res response to that, all these, you're, you're, it's a woman's right to choose. To choose what? To not be strapped down with the child. Here's where I'm concerned. Side note, this is not really supposed to be about Planned Parenthood, but since it's there for us, side note, uh, hear, me, hear me accurately here. I hope, I pray, that conservatism will be able to defund Planned Parenthood. I pray that's the case. I have very little hope it'll happen. 
Why? Because our culture doesn't care about the babies or it wouldn't be happening. There's no way we allow this to go on for all these decades and allow our tax dollars to go there if we as a culture really cared about the babies. There may be individuals that do, but friends, we do not have a William Wilberforce in our government right now who is willing to bring this up and be a pain in the neck year after year after year after year after year until it finally gets done. We don't have that person, at least that I know of. Maybe God will raise him or her up, and we should pray to that end. But I really think we're being naive to think that we're going to win this battle. I don't say that as a cynic. I'm praying for it. Don't get me wrong. I, I, I want it to happen. And God can come in and say, you have little faith. And I hope he does. But our culture doesn't think it's a baby. It's a woman's right to be like the man. Because feminism has won the day. And anybody who opposes that is a sexist and hates women. So what then does marriage look like when it's been feminized? Marriage, what's this relationship between a man and woman look like when it's been feminized? Well, clearly there can be no gender-specific roles. You can't have something unique to men because that goes against the agenda. Both spouses must be equal in responsibility. The traditional view of the husband as provider, protector, and leader of the wife has to go because it creates distinctions. And the traditional view of a wife as the helper and follower has to go because that means she's distinct. Feminized, feminized wife doesn't take her husband's last name because that sounds too much like she's being swallowed up into him. She doesn't want to carry a man's name. Forgetting the fact that she's carrying her dad's name, right? Someday that'll probably stop. She has to be independent and distinct from her husband. Did you catch that? This movement that's trying to eradicate distinctions, the woman's saying, I will not take his last name because I have to be distinct from him. It's a one-sided distinction. So the feminist marriage is a partnership of equality and indistinction. The only difference between male and female participants is body parts. Can't have a distinction of roles and responsibilities, just body parts. And you're not allowed to make any conclusions, draw any conclusions from body parts. That being the case, it was just a matter of time before even body parts were irrelevant to marriage. It had to go there. With no gender-specific distinctions, what difference does it make which gender any partner is? It doesn't make any difference. Since a man has no distinct role in marriage, there's no reason why he has to marry a woman or why a woman has to marry a man. In fact, two women together are the perfect combination because there's no distinction. Two men together, there's, there's no gender conflict because of the same gender. It had to go there. So body parts are meaningless. Now, maleness is not uh, from, it's from an, it's not from anatomy, it's from identity. A woman who chooses to be a man must be allowed to use the man's bathroom even if she can't use a urinal. Someday, mark my words, someday urinals are going to be ruled out. They're going to be sexist. You watch. A woman must not be denied the rights to be a man simply because she's a woman. That's where we're at, and that's where we had to get to. Not only did feminism set the table for gayism and transgenderism, it also laid the groundwork for discrimination against you and me. Think about it. Now that society accepts it, now that there's no legal ramification, what is the only enemy to gayism and transgenderism? The only enemy. It's us those who hold a traditional marriage. That's it. We're the only threat. Society accepts them. The law accepts them. Everybody accepts them, except for those of us who say, God doesn't accept it. And we're the enemy. And I don't think they're going to stop until we stop. 
more and more and more, our saltiness will be tested. Are we going to be the salt of the earth? Front Range Alliance Church is. Amen? That was almost good. So how do we do this? How do we stay salty? How do we hold fast to the truth? Well, I've been talking about it for several weeks now, but one of the things we have to do is get back to, without shame, the biblical teaching on male headship. It's not an ambiguous topic in the Bible. Any 10-year-old reading the Bible for the first time would understand clearly what it says about husbands and wives. If you have to write a book this thick to explain why when it says the man is the head of his home, and to explain why that's not the head of the home, something's probably wrong. It shouldn't take 400, 600 pages to write a book on this. It's clear. We can't shy away. We can't let them distort it into some kind of a chauvinistic, sexist, abusive view. We actually have to... Take this teaching as something wonderful. But we have to believe it's wonderful. God's word's not ambiguous. If you have your Bibles, look with me at Ephesians 5. If you don't have your Bibles, why don't you have your Bibles? (laughs) Yeah, we're going to put some of it on the screen in a minute. Um, I've taught, I'm not teaching two husbands and wives here. I I heard uh, some expectations that this is going to be another husband and wife sermon. It's not. Uh, I've done that multiple times in other places. This is is for all of us, married or not, it doesn't matter. If if you're never going to get married, we have to understand what the Bible, no, I'm not ready for that. Go away. Uh, We have to know what the Bible teaches here because it matters. Um. Again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, but the context of this is, uh, is something that's often lost. So when we get to verse 22, and it talks about wives being submissive to husbands and then husbands being the head of the home, it's the continuation of what he has been saying, and it flows from uh, verse 18, which says, Do not get drunk with wine, for that is a waste, that's dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. That's the controlling phrase for the next chapter and a half. Be filled with the Spirit. That's us. As Christians, we are filled with the Spirit. The Spirit of God indwells us. He empowers us. He changes us. He bears His fruit in us and through us. And then He gives some specific ways in which this filling of the Spirit is manifested. In the Greek language, uh, it's very clear. It doesn't come across so clear in English, but in Greek language, you have the controlling verb, uh, the command, be filled And then you have these participle phrases. And I know for most of you, participles are meaningless, and and that's okay. Just trust me, okay? Trust me on this. You have these different phrases that that explain what this filling looks like, what it it acts like, what it is, and they're the I-N-G words of of this passage. So be filled with the Spirit, uh, speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. As we gather together on Sunday morning and sing... That is an expression of being filled with the Spirit, according to Ephesians 5. We gather here, and we worship, and we encourage one another. That is the Spirit working in us and through us. Singing, making melody in our heart to the Lord, whether you're here together or just in your car or at home, when you're singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, that is the Spirit of God that's being filled with the Spirit. You can worship personally and be filled with the Spirit. Always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father. That giving thanks is the Spirit's work. It's part of being filled with the Spirit. As our lips say repeatedly over and over again, thank you, Lord, and show our gratitude and show our thankfulness to all that he has done, that is being filled with the Spirit. That's how it plays out in life. It's not just some experience of the Spirit filled me. It's not, that's not what he means. It's these things. And then the fourth thing he lists is submitting yourselves to one another in the fear of Christ. This is part of being filled with the Spirit. Now here's where people go. Here's where so-called 
feminist Christians or Christian feminists go and they say, well, it says submit to one another, so we're supposed to submit to everybody. No, that's not what it does. It goes on and gives three relationships of how this submission works. The last one is slaves to masters. The second one is children to parents. The first one is wives to husbands. It doesn't go the other way. Nowhere in the scripture are masters told to submit to their slaves. Nowhere, praise Jesus, are parents told to submit to their children. It's not in there. It's not in there. And nowhere are husbands told to submit to wives. It's the other way around. And it's part of being filled with the Spirit. It's in the manifestation and expression of those who are filled with the Spirit. Wives, submit to your husbands. So that's verse 22. Come on, Jeremy. What are you waiting on? Wives. <laughs> Here's the command to wives. Be subject to your own husbands as, some of you have heard me speak on this so many times, that little word as is a massive word in comparison to the way you submit to the Lord. As I like to say, you are commanded to submit to your husband in the same way that you submit to the Lord, and you usually do, one way or the other. But it's the next verse. For the husband, this is why wives are to submit to their husbands. For the husband is the head of the wife as, same word, as Christ is the head of the church. This is why wives are called to submit, because the husband is the head of the wife. In comparison to Christ being the head of the church. Here's Christ. He's the head of the church. Here's the husband. He's the head of his wife. It's very, very simple. There is no ambiguity in this text. But some people try to create ambiguity. They say, well, head, kephale in Greek, means fountain. It, it, it does. In the plural, on a few occasions, it means fountain, like the head of a, of a bunch of streams coming together to form a river. But in the singular, it never means that. And more importantly, look back at Ephesians chapter 1. The Apostle Paul tells us exactly what he means by the word head. Chapter 1, verse 20, he's talking about these things which were brought about in Christ. Now speaking of Christ, he says, when he raised him from the dead, when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him, seated Christ at the right hand in the heavenly places far above all rule, authority, power, and dominion, and every name that is named. So Jesus is in rule and authority and power and dominion over everybody else, not only in this, this age, but also in the one to come. And he put him, all things in submission under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church. There's no ambiguity there. He's not talking about the source or the fountain. He's talking about Jesus as king. And the church is to submit to Jesus as king because he's been placed over all rule and authority. And then Paul has the audacity in Ephesians 5 to say, just like Christ is the head of the church, husbands are the head of the wife. What does he mean? He means husband is the ruler and the kingly representative of his wife. And she is to submit to him. That's what it says. That's what it says. First Peter 3 says the same thing. So it's not just Paul. It's not like Paul had a bad marriage and he just hated women and something and he went off on girls. Peter says the same thing. In the same way, referring back to something else, you wives be submissive to your own husbands so that even if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be won without a word by the behavior of their wives. Verse 5 
For in this way, in former times, the holy women also who hoped in God used to adorn themselves, being submissive to their own husbands, just as Sarah obeyed Abraham. I don't know how many people I've had say to me, well, submission in the Bible doesn't mean obedience. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Peter just said the holy women of old submitted to their husbands as Sarah obeyed Abraham. And you, wives, are her children if you do what is right without fear. What what right? Submit to your husbands. It's not my word. Don't get mad at me, women. Now, why does he do this? Why does God do this? Because of what we talked about in previous weeks, marriage was established as a picture of Christ in the church. He didn't create it merely to make babies. He didn't create it merely to make us happy. He created it primarily to represent Christ and the church. That's why he did this. There's, women are not in the least inferior to men. Not in the least. Women are not less dignified, they're not less intelligent, they're not less capable of making decisions. It has nothing to do with any of that. It is simply because God said, I want to give the world a picture of my son and his bride. And my son is the king. And so I'm going to create men to be small k kings. And his bride is the church who loves him and supports him and obeys him. And I want to give the world a picture of that, so I'm going to create a wife to love and obey and support her husband so the whole world can see what it means to to, to be part of Christ's marriage. I got to tell you, I think we should be sad if we don't like this. If we're embarrassed of this, if we're ashamed of this, if we sort of apologize for Ephesians 5, I think it makes our Savior disappointed. Because why would we not like this? Because we start thinking it's about us. It's about me. Uh, Jesus, I don't want to be the head. I didn't sign up for this. Well, I did, actually. If you got married, man, you signed up for this. I don't care what the vows were in your ceremony. I don't care what you knew or didn't know. God's the one who decides what marriage is. And regardless of what you actually said, this is what you signed up for, men, to be the head of your wife and represent Jesus. You didn't get that choice. God made that choice. And you're either a good head of your wife or a bad head of your wife, but you can never choose not to be the head of your wife because that's what husbands are. It's not all that easy, ladies. I didn't read it, but it says I'm supposed to love this woman here like Christ loves me. I don't always do that. Amen? She's so good. (laughs) I don't always do that. Sometimes I don't represent Jesus very well to her. It's hard. Give myself for her. Sacrifice myself for her. Do all that I do so that she is spotless and beautiful and blameless in his sight. Cherish her and nourish her and think of her needs above my own. That's hard work for a person who's selfish. But that's what Jesus did for me. He gave himself for my good. And that's my role and responsibility for Krista. And actually, as the years go on, I think she would tell you this. You can ask her. We both realize how wonderful this picture is. She's pretty easy, actually. I married well doesn't take a lot of self-sacrifice to please her and to help her. 
I know you're, some of you are saying, well, it's easy for you. You're the guy. You get to be in charge. I didn't make the rules. I didn't choose to be a man. I'm just doing what I'm told because I love Jesus more than I love myself most of the time. Uh, there, there are a million qualifications that want to come out here. You know, why is this is not an excuse to abuse? It doesn't mean the wife just sits there and takes it and be the doormat and all that. And I've, I've preached on that a, a hundred times. You can track it down. I'd be happy to point you to resources. Yes, all those things are true. But at the end of the day, this is what marriage is supposed to be. The husband is the head of his wife. The wife is to submit to her husband. And we as Christians, it's not good enough to simply tolerate this truth. That does not please Jesus. We have to embrace it and be excited about it and find joy in it. If we don't, what are we saying about God who made it? God, you did a lot of things right, but. God, you know, you're pretty wise in a lot of areas, but. God, you've done a lot of things for my good, but uh, not this. All things work together for our good. Does that all include marriage? Does that all include headship and submission? Yeah, it does. It does. Our culture does not know better than God. Really, we're going to let feminists tell us what marriage should be? We're going to let politicians tell us what marriage should be? We're going to let Radio talk show, book authors, tell us what marriage should be. No, we are going to let Jesus tell us what marriage should be because we are Christians. And Jesus says, this is how I set it up. This is the picture. This is another means of getting the gospel to people. Look, the world wants to convince us that, that they got it good, that they love it. They don't love it. They're fighting against their nature. They're fighting against the way God created it. They're fighting against his design. They are not satisfied. They are not fulfilled. They are not happy. Oh, there's pleasure. There's temporary pleasure for sure, because we always get temporary pleasure when we defy God, or else we wouldn't want to do it. But there's not long-lasting satisfaction. I mean, I counsel Christian wives all the time who are desperate for their husbands to be the head of the home. Women are designed to want a head. Who wouldn't want Jesus for a husband? And men, the more we act like Jesus in our husbanding, the women say, ah, there's security, there's joy in this. The world doesn't know anything about this, and we can show them, and we can tell them, and we must. In your neighborhoods, if there are a lot of non-Christians or in your, uh, uh, on your floors at work, there are not a lot of Christians, you can show them something that down deep they know is what they really want. Because God's design is not easily destroyed. Ah, some people are going to think we're wacko. They're going to think we're woman haters. But some people are going to come ask us, there's something different about your relationship. What is it? You can tell them. It's because we're doing it the way God designed it. And why did he design it? He designed it to give us a picture of Christ in the church. Let me tell you about Jesus. And there we go. This is good for the world. It's good for the world. I don't care if you're married or not, single, if you hope to be married someday or not, God wants you to be excited about male headship. Again, it is not okay to simply tolerate this, to apologize for it, to skip over it, say, yeah, it's what it's supposed to be. No, he expects us to be joyful and excited about it, man or woman, boy or girl. Girls who are hoping to be married someday, you need to look for a man who will be your head. Because God designed it that way. And young single men, you need to start training now, if you're not already, to be a godly husband because that's how he set it up, to be the head of your wife. 
Learn what that means. And all of us collectively have to see this as something that we are joyful about because it's God's design. Don't ever apologize for it. Don't ever minimize it. Yes, there are abuses. The design is not abusive. People are abusive. And when a man beats his wife, it has nothing to do with being her head. It's because he's a jerk. And if he were beating a man, it would be the same sin. This is not a sexist issue. That's how the feminists have painted it. No, he's not loving somebody else. He's not loving his closest neighbor. And he's offending God when he does that. And she doesn't just have to sit there and take it. If a husband is beating a wife, she should call the cops. He's committing a crime. He needs to go to jail. But the design is not flawed. People are flawed. The design is glorious and beautiful. And if we as Christians are sheepish about this, if we're cowardly about this, how are we ever going to talk to them about anything? This is so clear. At Front Range Alliance Church, I hope that as the world continues to turn up the heat against sexual truth and righteousness, that we will add to our list of things that we're excited about. That God created the husband to be the head of his wife. And when it's done right, it's beautiful. And it's glorious. And it pleases him. Let's pray. Father, I ask right now that the spirit that fills us, the spirit that leads us and protects us, that he would fill this place, that he would fill our hearts, and that you would protect us from the lies of the enemy that want to invade our hearts right now. He has been a deceiver from the beginning. He led Eve astray. He led Adam astray. He's led our culture astray. Father, do not allow him to lead us astray. Keep our minds focused on truth. The feminism that has invaded our culture and taken our culture hostage for decades now, it infiltrated the church. It's it's part of our makeup as, as Americans. Father, let us see what is real and true and reject the lies of the enemy. Make all of us people who have counted the cost and are willing to be salt, regardless of what the world thinks, that we will stand firm, speak truth, live truth, love the truth, knowing that for some of them in your sovereign grace, some of them are going to come to faith in Jesus Christ because they heard and they saw the truth. And some of our neighbors and family and friends and co-workers are going to repent of their sins and place their faith in the salvation that comes only through Jesus Christ because your church proclaimed truth. Make us bold, gracious, loving, kind, gentle, and bold for the sake of this world. For the sake of our Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name I pray. Amen.